the media uploaded by LGBT Anonymous does not represent the Anonymous movement or the LGBT movement. They are just ideas that have been thought of as worth watching due to the fact that they promote the freeing of humanity in some way shape or form. If you would like to learn and grow with us then please subscribe, join our social networks and feel free to email us with content that you would like to see uploaded to our channel. We at LGBT Anonymous acknowledge and support all gender identities. Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Carolyn Baker. She's the author of Collapsing Consciously, Transformative Truth for Turbulent Times. Her previous books are Navigating the Coming Crisis, or I'm sorry, Navigating the Coming Chaos, A Handbook for Inner Transition, and Sacred Demise, Walking the Spiritual Path of Industrial Civilization's Collapse. She lives and writes in Boulder, Colorado. I think... Um, you know, you and I emailed a little bit about what we were going to talk about, and where I want to go in a little while is the connection between the the sacred and resistance. But right. I'm wondering if before we get there, if we can just sort of do an overview of like what does it mean to walk the spiritual path of industrial civilizations? You know, what 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 does it mean to collapse consciously, and then we'll move from there to to the resistance question. Sure. Um, yeah, I'd like to start out with a quote from your book, Dreams, on page 18, where you've been talking about the mystery or the other side or the place where dreams come from. And you say, is it possible that there's a correlation between this culture's lack of real relationship with these other sides and the fact that it's destroying everything it touches? And so all of my work is about clarifying this correlation, which I call a connection with the sacred. It's all about helping people do the psycho-spiritual work that they need to do in order to become more resilient, more resisting, more robust in the face of a society unraveling and a planet that's terminal, terminally ill as a result of humanity's omnicidal behavior. Um, so it's about walking this collapse consciously, not resisting it, not saying, oh, it's not really going to happen, or it'll happen, but it won't be so bad, but really being open to the possibility that this is a very necessary transition for all species, um, and certainly for us. So it, it reminds me of um, a conversation I had with, my friend Jeanette Armstrong, gosh, 15 years ago, 18 years ago now probably, where, you know, I'd been doing activism at that point for five or six years, and um, I called her up one day and was just, I was just sobbing. I said, you know, this work's killing me. It's it's breaking my heart. When, there's not going to be some great, glorious, wonderful transition that is painless, is there? And her response was the best thing she could possibly say, which is, I've been waiting for you to say that. <laughs> yeah. And the reason that was so wonderful is because it normalized my despair. And it let me know that despair is absolutely an appropriate response to a desperate situation. And it let me stop fighting it and start going, okay, what are we going to do about it? Yeah, exactly. Um, I notice, well, I do a lot of life coaching, and people call me all the time for a variety of reasons related to collapse, but um, I notice that when people genuinely, seriously start looking at the planet's predicament, which is our predicament as well, uh, they generally do one of two things. They either go into massive denial and consume more, eat more, have sex more, party more, and generally pillage the planet more, uh, or they become willing to look, first of all, at their emotions head on. On. And that means they usually first have to look at their fear, and then they begin noticing some other emotions like anger and grief and despair. And then I notice that they begin to start asking more existential questions about meaning and purpose, which, by the way, people tend to do when they're confronted with their own death and when their lives begin to either turn upside down or dramatically shift in some way. Um, and so what I also notice about these folks is that when they can really allow themselves to face the truth and deal with these so-called negative emotions, 
paradoxically, they begin to feel more alive than they've ever felt. And many tell me that they're experiencing a deeper and more palpable sense of joy than they've ever experienced. And, and you know, it's, it's my experience, too, that um, once I stopped, but I was spending more energy attempting to not feel all those things than... There was, there's this idea that if you understand how bad things are, that you have to go around... Um, being miserable all the time, mm-hmm. and I think that that's one of the blocks to people actually um, working to defend wild places or whatever is, is they they just they can't. And we see this, of course, in abusive families too. Absolutely, um, where yeah. we'll we'll put up with anything we can not to do the the jarring transition. Right. Right. Well, you know, one of my favorite quotes of yours all t- from all time, and I don't know what book it was in, but, you know, when you say um, we're fucked and life is really, really good. Um, and, you know, I, I do run into a lot of people who just, you know, want to throw in the towel and what's the point and maybe they're suicidal. We're only going to be here for a few more years, blah, blah, blah. And for me, it's, um, which I'll get into talking about a little bit more as we progress here probably, it's, it's more about, you know, looking at perhaps um, we're in some kind of hospice situation or some kind of transitional situation, which is not that glorious Hollywood ending that we thought we were going to have, um, which which is not the same as giving up, but it's it's a sense of um, acceptance and surrender to all possibilities, and. Um, you know, we need we need grace for that. We need we need to do some emotional work before we're ready to to open ourselves to that. So, tell me about your um, your own. How did your how did your thought develop along this? Sure. Um, well, I was born and raised in screaming evangelical fundamentalist Christian hell, um, and I had to work through that when, in the first part of my adult life. And then, um, you know, I was always kind of your basic democratic liberal, you know, keeping up on the news and hoping for the next progressive president to get elected and blah, blah. And then in the year 2000, I began to seriously, part of it was as a result of the so-called 2000 election, and part of it was a result of 9-11 and a few other things. And I began to really look at the situation going on in the world, you know, in a larger picture. Um, However, for the first probably seven years, I saw, you know, a lot of different problems that seemed unconnected. You know, there's peak oil, and there's a housing bubble and there's environmental crises and so on. And then it was in 2007 that I actually saw the uh, movie, which anyone can watch online now. It's two hours. Um, What a way to go, Life at the End of Empire. And um, I was able then, as a result of watching that documentary, to really name all of this and see that all of these problems were connected, namely that this was the collapse of industrial civilization. And so, having been a therapist for 17 years, um, the first place I go with this is not how do we store food and water and how do we get beans and bullets, but rather, how are people going to deal with this emotionally and spiritually? So then I began to make some notes for writing uh, Sacred Demise, which I published in 2009, and figured I'd sell maybe 20 books, you know, <laughs> of Sacred Demise. It turns out it was it was quite successful, and then I decided to take it to the next level and wrote Navigating the Coming Chaos, which is more of an emotional toolkit for dealing with... Um, what we're experiencing. And then um, I had always wanted to write a book of reflections, daily reflections. So I wrote a book of daily reflections on collapse, 365 of them, along with 17 essays, and I submitted those to North Atlantic Books last year, and they said, well, this is great, but it's going to be a very large book. How about if we take the essays and pull 52 weekly reflections and make that a hard copy and then take the other 313 reflections and make it an e-book? So that's what North Atlantic Book did. 
uh, North Atlantic Books did, and um, it happens to be in a series that was formed by Andrew Harvey. Uh, it's called a Sacred Activism series, um, and included in that is another book by Adam Bucco and Matthew Fox called Occupy Spirituality, and Charles Eisenstein's new book, uh, A More Beautiful World That Our Hearts Know Is Possible. So, can you? What are to give to give readers a feel for listeners a feel for this? Can you can you list off um, three or four of your favorite um, of the those those uh, truths? Sure. Um, I just my eyes are falling right now on um, a line from a William Stafford poem, and he says, "There's a thread you follow." This is called the poem, "The Thread." There's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. And so my little reflection on that is, perhaps nothing in these turbulent times is more urgent than our awareness that the thread lives within us and that we feel its presence in our lives. In times of dizzying and daunting change, the thread remains, always available for us to touch and pluck. And in so doing, we feel our connection with ancestors, ancient wisdom, timeless truths, and the eternal remnants of the sacred. Our work is not only to hold on to this red, but to use it to reweave and remake our world with the unraveling fibers of a garment we inherited from the Enlightenment, a garment that eventually became a smothering weight upon our souls and a blanket of seduction and sorrow. While we hold the thread, Stafford assures us, we can't get lost. Things fall apart, people question our choices, perhaps even conclude that we are insane. Yet we hold on to the thread and help our fellow human beings find theirs. When we feel overwhelmed, we hang on to the thread, and when our neighbor is near succumbing to madness, we offer a poem, a song, a story, or something beautiful to soothe and soften the terror, something that will remind him or her of the thread that they haven't found but have never lost. As we cherish the thread, we increasingly understand how intimately we are all woven together in a garment called life. In fact, that is what turbulent times have always taught humans. Um, I, I really like that, and this may be the stupidest question ever, <laughs> but um, sometimes, sometimes, I mean, I love, I love, when things are very poetic, and then sometimes I need some help grounding them again. So what what is the thread? For me, the thread is the sacred that's in all of us, um, something greater than the human mind and the, and the rational ego. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's that greater self. And, you know, there are a lot of different names for it, and people can call it whatever they like, but it's, it's that changeless piece of eternity within us that uh, is always there. What, what, is, what is, obviously you've written a lot about the sacred. What is the sacred? What, is, what does that mean? Well, um, you know, literally the word sacred means set apart. Um, it often has to do with, uh, re- it, it's often related to the word sacrifice, that we have to give up something uh, to make something very special and hallowed and revered. Um, it is that changeless part of us that some people would call divine, um, that some people would call beyond human, uh, but it is inextricably connected with nature. Um, some people would call it spirit in matter. And I think we more deeply experience it the more intimately connected with nature we are. You, <clears throat> you mentioned the Enlightenment a minute ago, mm-hmm. and <clears throat> excuse me. One of my favorite lines from Dreams is, is actually I got from a friend of mine, um, and the line is that Christianity did a lot of the heavy lifting of desacralizing the world by making a a sky god who you know the sacred is is invested not in the earth and every everyone here but instead in someone who's a long ways away and then enlightenment the enlightenment and scientific philosophy has done the next step of just simply removing the sky god altogether and then there's nothing left that's sacred and is that part of what you're getting at with uh, the enlightenment heavy blanket yeah um exactly and um 
that belief that, um, you know, as you talk about in dreams, that the scientific, the materialistic, uh, the intellectual, um, I forget those three adjectives, the, oh, materialistic, instrumentalist, and mechanistic, um, that, that those are supreme, almost as if those are sacred. And, um, and that what we feel is not that important, um, that the heart is not that important. What really matters is the mind and the intellect. And, um, you know, and then that leads to, well, science is, is science is the scion, you know, of society. Science is God. And we have to trust and depend on science, which you point out beautifully in dreams is, is really all about faith. And so what that's led to is, a, you know, that just laid the groundwork for the creation of industrial civilization and getting us further and further away from our hearts and more into the notion that we're separate from, from nature, that we're separate from each other. Um, and so I think a lot, of, a lot of our work as we walk this path of consciously dealing with collapse is to uncolonize ourselves to liberate ourselves from that enlight- enlightenment thinking. So how do how do we do that? And um, so two questions. One, how do we do that? And also, um, I just got a note today, and I'm sure you get a lot of these notes, and I do too, with somebody saying, you know, I I am an activist. I'm doing things, but the the despair really gets to me, and I don't know what to do. I don't know. How do I, how do I continue in the face of the horrors? Right. And so, what, 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 what is your response to that? What is, how, what do you say to people like that? Yeah, I do hear that frequently. Um, in my book, Navigating the Coming Chaos, I talk about the big five emotions that, that this huge cataclysm is evoking in all of us, which is fear, um, anger, grief, despair, and the one that people don't anticipate as joy. Um, despair is, um, you know, I, I, on the one hand, it's a terrible place to be. On, an, on the other hand, um, there's tremendous opportunity in despair. And uh, I recently published a series on my website at carolynbaker.net on what collapse feels, feels like. And um, it, it's a five-part series, and one of those parts is on despair. And I talk a lot in there about Viktor Frankl and what he, you know, what he learned about um, despair in the in the death camps and um, how it always is a choice. It always presents us with a choice. You know, am I going to completely succumb here, or am I going to find a reason to go on? And what are those reasons? And um, then it takes us to meaning and purpose. You know, why am I here? What did I come here to do? And who do I want to be as I go through this process? And and then also, um, how do I create joy in my life? Because despair isn't all there is. And even in deaf camps, people told jokes and they told funny stories and they created humorous situations because they had to. Um, so, you know, I, I see all of that as, as a way of dealing with despair. You know, sometimes, and maybe this is a transition into the to the resistance, and it's very clear when when we talk about resistance that we're not talking about resisting the situation. We're not talking about resisting the emotional implications of the situation. We're talking about resisting the horrors. We're talking right. about actually um, attempting to do something good. And so often, I mean, there are there are so many reasons that we can find, or justifications is perhaps a better word, there are so many justifications that we can find to not act in the face of horrors. It can be we're too scared, it can be we don't have time, it can be, um, you know, we can, we, can, we can use spirituality for that and say, mm-hmm. oh, I'm detached from all this. Mm-hmm. And, so, and, and I'm not saying that, that there aren't people who simply don't have time. You know, if you're, if you're working two jobs and have four children and, you know, making 20 a year, that's a very, very problematical place to be in. Right. Um, and there are all sorts of primary emergencies that people have to deal with. But 
but nonetheless, can you talk then about, I want to do a quote of yours, and then can we talk a little bit about, first, the use of spirituality as a justification for doing nothing, um, and then and then your perspective and my perspective, which is which is quite the opposite, that the spirituality needs to lead us to act. Right. And the, the quote of yours, which is just fabulous, is, some people who do not understand my work believe that in the face of the collapse of industrial civilization and catastrophic climate change, I'm only seeking to dispense inner peace and assist people in completely and comfortably capitulating to our collective predicament. It's really nice language, too. Were they to pay attention to my writing and speaking, they would hear my incessant rants on resistance and service in a time of collective demise. Well, um, in my next book, which is going to be called Love in the Last Emergency, um, I'm going to be talking about spiritual bypassing somewhat, which is essentially that we use spirituality in, in many ways, not just in terms of resistance, not to act or to not feel our feelings or to do something else and say, well, I'm spiritual, I, don't, I can't dirty my hands or I can't dirty my emotions with this or whatever. Um, so... Um, yeah, we um, we can certainly spiritually bypass, and that's not what I'm talking about at all. Um, I'm talking about, you know, Matthew Fox, uh, dear soul that he is, you know, one of the greatest activists of all time. Um, you know, he, he once said something like, um, the purpose of spirituality is to help us become more human. And I really like that, and I really attempt to live by that, um, that we're here to become more compassionate, more involved in our world, more embodied, more deeply intimate with nature. And so as we do that, holding the sacred in our hearts and also being in our bodies, we're just going to naturally want to be activists, to resist. You know, Edward Abbey says um, action is a great antidote to despair. And even if the action is futile, um, I think we have to be active. And say the sacred and our spiritual path goes hand in hand with our activism. And so if we're, we're trying to bypass and, and we're kind of saying, well, I'm above that or beyond that, uh, then we're missing the point of spirituality. So what, um, let's, let's get, let's go back to the notion, I think that's really great, and let's go back to the notion of, um, of, I mean, what, what do you want, what would you have the readers of your work do? And I get asked this all the time, I can give you my answer if you want. Okay. But, what what do you want what do you want people to do with the information and the analysis that that you that you give to people and then what do you yeah it was, and then and then also there's two questions so first what do you what do you want them to do with this information and second what do you say when people say well what should I do All right um, I have written three books now that really have a lot of tools in them, particularly navigating the coming chaos. And I want people to pick up those tools, open the toolbox, pick up the tools, put them in their hands, and use them. Um, which means doing spiritual work and emotional work, or psycho-spiritual work, if you will, on these big five emotions, fear, anger, grief, despair. And um, I've, I've found that as a result of doing that work, on those four emotions, our joy is deepened. So I really want people to work with those so-called negative emotions that the Enlightenment and Freud and everybody else has told us we shouldn't touch because those will make us feel bad. That I see that through working with those emotions, um, we, we can become more resilient, we can become more resisting, uh, we can become more responsive to each other, and feel ourselves much more connected. Um, and we can really use those emotions to uncolonize ourselves from this colonizing, mind-raping, soul-murdering culture. What, I'm, I'm sorry to be dense, but what do you mean by working with anger? What do okay. you, what do you, what do you, 
what what does that actually mean? What what that means is you know, um, and I've got some specific tools, and I owe a lot of um, the use of these tools to um, Miriam Greenspan, who wrote a wonderful book called Healing Through the Dark Emotions. Um, her parents were Holocaust survivors. She's gone through a you know a lot of trauma in her own life, and you know um, she talks about you know okay, it's fear, it's anger, it's whatever. So so we let that in, you know. And maybe we need to do this with a friend. Maybe we start out with just some journaling. And maybe we sit with a friend and we vent. Um, Or maybe, you know, we sit with a friend and we hit some pillows. Or we go out in nature and we scream. Um, And so much of this is about grief and allowing ourselves to sob and wail and allowing the tears of grief to flow through us and cleanse us and then empower us to go out and find our place in resistance or whatever it is that we need to do. Um, Okay, so once again, let's get really tangible. So I'm, I'm really angry. First off, how do I tell whether I'm just an angry person or whether I'm angry because I'm working a job I don't like or whether I'm angry because I'm in a bad relationship or whether I'm angry because I'm a jerk or whether I'm angry because the society is doing horrible things to me, you know, in in terms of of it's killing the planet. And so how do I, how do I, um, given all those, first, how do I differentiate and then how do I, how do I, um, you know, what What good does it do me to go out in nature and scream or to hit a pillow? What, yeah, what right. do I do with that? Those are good questions. Um, yeah, okay, so one of the first places I would start with is some journaling because a person who's just an angry person, you know, uh, for whatever reason, is probably not going to sit down and honestly journal. Journaling is the beginning of a, of a journey. That journey and journaling are very related words. Um, it's the beginning of an exploration. And so I'm going to sit down and I'm going to journal about why I'm angry. And that's probably going to bring up stuff. It's going to probably connect a lot of dots for me. And um, and then I'm going to be able to probably, as a first step, look at my reasons for anger, You know, whether they are societal or whether they have to do with what my father did to me or, you know, the job that I hate or whatever. That's a way of beginning to sort that out. And and then I, you know, and then I become focused on, okay, well, you know, maybe I can't do a lot about what my father did to me, but I can certainly focus on what what the powers that be are doing to this planet. And I can go out and scream. And I can talk to other people about it, and I can continue to journal about it. And I can let that anger motivate me and compel me to get involved in making a difference in some way. Does that make sense? Yeah, it it does. And the reason I'm asking this question is because um, there's something that my friend George Draffin said to me many, many years ago um, has always stuck with me, and I've, I've... I've never really known what to do with it, and he helped bring Earth First to Washington State back in the early 80s, and then he quit Earth First about 1989 or 1990, and what he said was that when he was in Earth First, it was a lot of people who were really angry about the forests, and what he saw happening that he didn't like was that there were a lot of really angry people who were joining it who had found an outlet for their anger through getting mad at forest, things in the forest. And he saw a fundamental difference between those two situations. And um, that... You know, I, I just finished writing a book on some of the problems in anarchism, and there's... Um, Something that sometime I mean, obviously, all my work is about resisting, fighting back, getting in touch with all the emotions. Just like, I mean, our, I, I find our work very complementary. Yes. And, and yet I have a problem with, having nothing to do with your work here, I have a problem with um, people who want to perhaps destroy things simply because they're angry people and they found an outlet for that destructive urge and 
um, and especially what what I'm thinking about especially has to do with 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 especially when you get into militant resistance that this is something I've discussed with um, with Chris Hedges that one of his concerns about militant resistance is that a lot of times the people who end up actually fighting when they're actually fighting they can be they can be you know trying to stop genocide in in Palestine or trying to stop genocide in in Serbia but um, or in Bosnia and at the but but when they're not actually fighting the enemy they would be off looting houses mm-hmm. do, do you see what I'm trying to get at yeah I do and um, I hasten to add that this emotion of anger is absolutely connected with fear and grief so if I'm around a person who's constantly pissed off and they want to go out and trash and that's all they want to do, then I'm going to be asking them questions about their fear, and I'm going to be inviting them to look at their fears and really go deep into exploration of that. Um, and I'm also going to be inviting them to look at their grief. And my experience is that when people can really look head on at their fears and their grief, they're probably going, that anger is probably going to be more balanced and find its own place in some way. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that. And I also need to stress that this is not only people who are resisting, that I know a fair number of veterans, like oh, Iraq yeah. War veterans, and they say some of the most, uh, some, some of the people that they were, that were also in their units, some of the most gung ho fighters were people who were just completely crazy. I mean they were yeah. they were they were psychopaths. Right. Um and so this this just happens in any any arena. I think that's right. And you know, boy, when you talk about veterans you're talking about huge, huge, huge grief work. My God. Enormous grief work that needs to be done there. So what, um, I know we've been sort of dancing around this, and I've asked this a couple different ways, but I think we're so, in this culture, we're, especially as, as it's been increasingly secularized. Okay, I was raised in a fundamentalist Christian uh, household, too, mm-hmm. and there were many, many terrible things about it. But one thing that I cherish from that is we were given a sense of the existence of the sacred. Mm-hmm. And um, I was raised Seventh-day Adventist. Mm-hmm. And in retrospect, I think it was wonderful that Saturdays we were not allowed to go shopping or to watch TV or to do... We, 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 I spent every Saturday in nature. Um, mm-hmm. And we were supposed to do... Basically, we had a choice. You could either read the Bible or you can go outside. And, you know, you either had to do a religious spiritual thing or you could do the the sacred thing in nature. Mm. And that was that was in retrospect that was one of the best parts of my childhood. And yes. So given the um sort of massive just tsunami of desacralization in this culture, how can people begin to reconnect? Where in in very very tangible terms, what would you suggest people do to 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 either a um, awaken the sacred if they have no clue if they don't, they don't even know what we're talking about at all mm-hmm. or b if you have a glimmer how can you or actually both so first off if you have no clue how can you how can you even awaken to what it is oh, I want to say one more thing which is I got interviewed by this guy from Nature Online last year and it just cracked me up it was it was. I have not yelled at very many people who have been interviewing me, and I yelled at him. Because one of his questions was, you know, nature doesn't even acknowledge that it exists. And if it goes, if, if it goes away, the only reason we care is because we care about nature. And non-humans don't care about their own existence. And as mm. he said this to me, mm. yeah. I was looking out the window, literally, I'm, I'm not making this up or exaggerating. I was looking out the window, and there was a mother bear lying just outside the window on her back, playing with her two cubs in the sunshine and the grass. Oh, wow. And I said to him, are you telling me that this mother does not appreciate, she's not having fun right now, she's not appreciating her children and life and the sun? And he said, no, she's not. She has no consciousness of her own of her own existence. So how do you awaken a sense of spirituality? My point is that that's just, we're, we're, that's the direction this whole culture pushes us all the time is to desacralize mm-hmm. or perhaps resacralize consumerism or some, you know, 
horrible toxic mimic. So how do you awaken it? How do you actually awaken it from the tiniest little seeds? Where do you find those seeds if you can't, if you don't know where they are? And then how do you nurture them? Yeah, that's a really tough question. Um, well, you know, um, I would want to encourage that person to um, actually, you know, spend some time watching those cubs or actually go out and sit by a stream. And maybe they would or maybe they wouldn't, but, you know, that's what I'd want to do. Or maybe go with them, you know, and just kind of observe with them if I could, if I could hold their hand and go with them and and we could talk about what we see. Um, you know, some people are so far removed that um, it's almost impossible, but it, it really has to do with the heart. And um, a lot of times until people are in some kind of crisis, that place is not accessible in their, in their you know, in their psyches. Um, And so, you know, especially during midlife, not exclusively, but especially during midlife and as we age, um, we we suffer a lot of loss. And, um, you know, I like to think of it in terms of, and this is something that I do in a lot of workshops, is I, I frame what we're experiencing as, you know, kind of like a tribal initiation where the young person is taken out. Um, in nature, by the community, to go through some sort of ordeal. And the purpose of that is to cause them to reach deep down in their soul and find the sacred and find who they really are. And, you know, Carl Jung went around all the world and he studied a lot of these tribes and studied initiation because he was really fascinated by it. And he came back and he said, you know, we don't have these kinds of initiations in the West, but what we do have are other kinds of losses. We have divorces, we have terminal illnesses, we have the loss of body parts, we have the loss of jobs, we have, and on and on and on. And um, so as we go through those experiences, it's kind of like an initiation. And the way I'm framing what we're experiencing right now in the larger picture is that humanity and the planet is going through an initiation process. And the interesting thing about initiations from the tribal perspective is that there's no guarantee that the young person was going to make it. The young person might die, and often they did. But the community felt it was so important for the transformation to happen that they were willing to take that risk. And so the different initiations in our life are times when when that part of us that is open to connection is more accessible. Of course, we can seal it over with a lot of rage and, and other things and consumerism, but it's right there. And if I can touch that in another person, then, you know, there's a chance that they can go deeper. You know, what you're saying reminds me of something that Luis Rodriguez, who wrote Gang Days in L.A. Oh, I love his work. Said to me, Yeah, he's great. Um, I asked him once why so many gang children or gang kids were killing mirror images of each other. I mean, if they're going to, you know, they're, they're shooting people, and a lot of times, I mean, they're not even shooting capitalists. You know, it's like they're not shooting the, the source of their pain at all, which... Why are they shooting mirror images? And he said, it's because they want to die. And the reason they want to die is because they're teenagers, and teenagers have to die. But what they don't understand is that that death can be spiritual and metaphorical. Mm -hmm. Because a teenager has to die to childhood to become an adult. Yes. And and we have that impulse. And, And honestly, this is one reason I think that this culture is killing the planet, is because we understand that this way of life needs to change. We understand there needs to be this huge wrenching transformation and we don't understand that this that this transformation needs to be metaphorical and spiritual and so we're killing the planet absolutely and so it seems to me that these transformations can't be avoided but instead they can either run roughshod over us they can let's see what was it was it young who said that one of the points Oh God, I'm, I'm going to totally, totally get this wrong, so please correct me on this. But basically, he said one of the things we're supposed to do in, in life is attempt to make as much of the unconscious conscious. Yes, that's true. That's correct. Um, and what I took that to mean is I can have all sorts of neuroses, which, which are impulses to do 
something, and if I don't understand them, they can control my life. But if I do understand what... Oh, a great example from my own life is that I had nightmares and night terrors five, six, seven, eight times a night all through my teens and 20s and 30s until, actually until I wrote a language older than words, which made sense and meaning out of the abuse of when I was a child. Mm. And that transition was actually even more difficult. I, that, that book was written completely sleep-deprived because I was so triggered that I was hard, I was sleeping like two hours a night. Mm. But then about four, six, eight, ten months after the book was done, the nightmares went away. And mm-hmm. I have them, you know, I have a nightmare once every four years now. <laughs> and the point is that I don't mean to be too teleological, but those, those, that, that was so important to my understanding of how, uh, I don't want to call the nightmares destructive, but I'm going to use the word just to, to get past it, that how destructive impulses can be, um, if they're in charge of us, they can, they can destroy our whole lives. But if we come to understand what's behind them, then we can actually use them. I, I love the story of Rumpelstiltskin in some ways in terms of turning straw to gold. Mm-hmm. Those are the parts that are bad, but I like that part. <laughs> um, so that was just a whole bunch of stuff to throw out there. Do you have? Do you want to say anything about it? Well, yeah, I do. Um, you're absolutely right, and and the whole point, you know, I'm I'll be teleo- teleological about it. I think there's a purpose in this trans in this transition right now and this horror that we're going through, which is to wake us up, to make us become conscious of who we actually are, and you know, I see it as a planetary initiation, as I said, and and I'm very concerned that um, that we're going to make it at all because the most recent and hard hitting climate science is telling us that by mid century there are likely to few be very few habitable places on this planet, and certainly by the end of this century, that's highly unlikely. And on top of that, we have a few terrifying knowns about the global repercussions of the Fukushima nuclear disaster, and probably hundreds of even more terrifying unknowns about it. Um, So I think that most of life on Earth is clearly facing near-term extinction, and in my work, I deal with people, many people every day, who realize that their own days are numbered, and they're carrying huge grief about what all of us have done to the planet. And I think that brings us right back to resistance because faced with... I have a dear friend, uh, environmentalist, who says that the reason he does the work he does is because we can't predict the future. And if grizzly bears are still around in 10 years, they may still be around in 100, but if they're gone in 10, they're gone forever. Mm -hmm. And if bull trout are still here in 10 years, they, they may still be here in 100. And I think that if there's even one one millionth of one one millionth of a one percent chance that any of our actions can lead to um, the world being, I mean, the oceans not being murdered, then of course we have to do it. Right, right. And I think one of the really important things right now is to make this demise of other species as easy for them as possible. I think that's our obligation, and certainly prevent it if we can, but, um, you know, have mercy on the other species. You know, I, I, I don't think that I am ready to put the earth in the hospice yet. I think we need to try very, very, very serious resistance first. Well, for me, it's not first, it's both and. (laughs) So I want to do very serious resistance, and I also want to consider the possibility that I'm in hospice. Right, right. So what else? What else? We have like one minute left. So what would you, what do you want for listeners to take away from the whole, from the conversation? I'd like them to take away um, the possibility that um, there is meaning and purpose in all of this madness, and that meaning and purpose um, has to do with, I think, primarily more than anything else, realizing the extent and the depth to which we are connected with everything. Oh, that's really beautiful. And um, and thank you so much for being my guest today. Well, thank you for having me. Um, thanks. And thank you, thank you everybody, for listening. Uh, my guest today 
has been Carolyn Baker. This is Derek Jensen from Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.